Hi folks, this is Color and Chemist. My name is Connie and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Well, are you ready? Today we start our pigment series. Oh, I should say before I forget, if you like what you're seeing, please consider hitting the like button, uh, subscribing to my channel, or leaving a comment down below. You might want to click on the uh, notification bell so you get notified of, of new videos that are coming up. And if you know of anyone that might like these kinds of videos, um, you know, the kind of mashup of chemistry and art, feel free to share my videos or, or share my channel on any of your social media channels. Before we do that, I just want to do a little bit of, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Since we're going to be talking about pigments, we need to know about the color index name codes. Now, lots of you might already know this, and if you're experienced colorists or artists, painters, this is, this is going to be, you, you know this. But the color index name codes are codes that are given to different pigment names. And they start with a P, so we might have, you know, the pigment number on a tube of paint that says PY and then gives a number. PY just stands for pigment yellow. And then there might be a number um, PY42. So that would be pigment yellow number 42. We can also have PO, which would be pigment orange. We can have PR, which is pigment red. Uh, we can have PB which is pigment blue. Uh, what else? PG, which is pigment green. We can have uh, pigment BR, so PBR, which is going to be pigment brown. Um, oh, PBK, which is, you guess, pigment black. What have I missed here? Oh, PV. Sorry, it should have been up with the colors, I guess, which would be pigment violet. And oh, PW. Pigment white. So these codes right here, and I think they're pretty, they're pretty self-explanatory, right? I mean, PY, pigment yellow, PO. Uh, you just have to, the B's you have to remember, so PB is always a pigment blue, PBR is a pigment brown, PBK is pigment black. Right? Now, we also need to remember that we're going to see pigment codes. We're also going to see pigment names. Um, you know, for example, um, PBK9 um, is something called ivory black. We also might see on our art materials, maybe there's a pencil called ivory black or a paint that's been labeled ivory black. In the higher quality art materials, that probably means that there is some PBK9 ivory black. That, that pigment, that individual pigment, there probably is some of that pigment in that particular pencil or paint, but not necessarily. <laughs> um, the color names, as far as I'm understanding, the color names that are given to the different pencils or paints or whatever by a company, they can name their colors whatever they like, right? So a, a pencil, for example, that's been labeled ivory black, you would hope it has some PBK9 in it, maybe, but it also might have other pigments in there as well. So that's why you can see, um, sometimes you can have art materials that have the same name. Like you might see, um, for example, uh, say yellow ochre. And you've got a yellow ochre pencil from this company, from this company, and this company. The colors, they all say yellow ochre on them. Now yellow ochre is an individual pigment, but that doesn't necessarily mean that each of those pencils just contains that yellow ochre pigment. Those companies looked at the color of their pencils and thought, yeah, that's pretty close to what yellow ochre, the color of yellow ochre is, so I guess we'll just call this yellow ochre. Maybe they contain yellow ochre pigment, maybe they contain yellow ochre pigment plus some other pigments. 
So just to, to try and draw a little bit of a line between pigments and their pigment codes and names and the color names that we see on our art material. Sometimes they're related, sometimes they're related more loosely than other times, um, but the colors that we see on particularly colored pencils, because we, we don't have pigment information on colored pencils, right? On paints, we often do. So when you hear artists talk about a single pigment paint, that means that the, the company has given pigment information for that paint and there is only one pigment in the paint and it'll tell you, it'll say, you know, PY42 or PR101 or, you know, so then we can say for sure, yes, that paint just has that one pigment, probably also carries that pigment name, you know, maybe, but just to, to differentiate a little bit between the idea of the color names that we see on our pencils and our art materials and pigment names. So hopefully that, that makes a little bit of sense. All right, so shall we get into the, uh, the pigments? Let's do it. I am going to get out, and I'm going to put a piece of paper down here. I decided to approach our pigment journey um, maybe a little bit differently than you might think. Instead of going color by color, which I know lots of people do, and it's a great way to approach things, I decided to do it a little bit differently. So here's the pigments that I want to look at uh, in this video. You ready? Here's that one. Straighten up my piece of paper there. And then we have this one. And then we have this one. And this one. Can you guess? Can you guess where we're starting? Or, or maybe I should more rightly say when we're starting our pigment journey? Where have you seen this combination of pigments before? Let's take a look at some pictures now, see if it'll uh, help you, help you to guess. Aren't those amazing? Those are amazing. And I think probably you guys have now figured out when we're going to start our pigment journey. These are prehistoric pigments, aren't they? So here we've got our red ochre. Here we've got our yellow ochre. Here we've got our whites. And here we've got black. These were the four pigment colors that prehistoric peoples used to create those amazing, amazing cave paintings, also called um, parietal art. It's another word for cave art. Why did they, you know, why? Why did the, this color palette, this red, yellow, black, white color palette, um, why do we see it repeated over and over and over again in cave paintings all around the world? This isn't just one area. So we're seeing cave paintings in Europe in South America, in Australia, in Africa, you know, why is it these four colors? Well, it has to do with partially dying stars <laughs> and also partially uh, the concept of a pigment versus a dye. Really quickly, a pigment is some kind of material that you can grind up and mix with a binder and then paint onto a surface. 
and the color that, that came, comes from the ground up, ground up pigment stays suspended in that binder. So you're applying it to the surface of whatever you're putting it on. So in these cave paintings, we see the pigments, the red ochre, the yellow ochre, um, the charcoal, which is where the black was coming from, the chalk, which is where a lot of the white was coming from. You, they would grind these up. They would put them into lots of times animal fat or some kind of sap or even saliva. Those are all things that could work really well as binders. And then they would paint them onto the rocks and they would stick to the surface of the rocks. That's what a pigment does. Even the pigments we use when we're coloring and when we're doing art, a pigment stays on the surface of your substrate. That's what you're, that whatever you're, you're coloring on, whether it be paper or painting on a canvas, painting on wood, the substrate is what you're, you're creating the art on. So the pigments, when they're in that binder, stay on the surface of your substrate. Dyes can also be from ground up materials that would cause color. Um, or you can get dyes by probably prehistoric people. I can't imagine they wouldn't have. Um, you know, say you're boiling up a pot of blueberries. You're going to get some pretty intensely blue water, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is a dye. A dye, the particle size is much smaller and when you put a dye onto a substrate, it doesn't stay on the surface. It soaks in, it actually soaks into your substrate. So pigment molecules are suspended in their binder and just stay on the surface. Dye molecules will, will dissolve in their binder and then go into the substrate. Prehistoric peoples, you know, like I say, I'm sure that they must have been boiling different flowers, leaves, roots, berries, etc., and saw these wonderful colored liquids. Maybe they were dyeing some of their textiles. Maybe they were dyeing some of their hides. That's possible. Those things don't really, I don't know that we have any archeological evidence of that from, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, because those things wouldn't last, right? Those dyes would produce wonderful, brilliant, bright colors. But think about trying to take those, those, you know, say you had a pot of blueberries and you boiled up some, some blueberries and you had this blue water. Try and put that on a rock surface. Even if you did get some blue color coming through, it would fade pretty quickly. It's, it's just not going to be permanent. A dye isn't going to work that way, right? It's probably just going to run off the rock and then it, it's not there anymore. So in order to get permanence, like those amazing cave paintings we saw, they needed pigments. And the, the, the most common pigments on Earth are iron-based. Why are they iron-based? Well, remember I said before, dying stars? <laughs> this, this, I, and it was funny. When I was researching and, and doing, you know, my reading and stuff to prep for this video, I went down a rabbit trail. And there, at some point when I had all the equations laid out for the alpha cycle of massive stars going supernova, and I had all the nuclear equations I stopped myself and I said, Connie, the people watching your videos are not going to want to know this. <laughs> You've gone too far. <laughs> you need to back up here. <laughs> so I'll try and condense this as much as I can. Out in the universe, you've got older stars, much older stars than our sun. And as a star goes through its life cycle, and there are different stars and different stars have different life cycles, but sometimes you get these massive stars bigger than our sun. And when they get old, they, they start to die, which means they basically have used up all of their hydrogen. Our sun, for example, um, produces light and heat because it has lots and lots of hydrogen in it still. And that hydrogen undergoes something called fusion, where two hydrogen atoms smush together really hard <laughs> and turn into helium. So remember our periodic table we looked at before? Hydrogen is an element, helium is an element. Two hydrogens smooshed together really hard under intense pressure and temperature can become helium. That's an example of what we call nuclear fusion. And young stars do that. And when that happens, lots of heat and lots of light is, is released. And so that's why our sun gives off this heat and light. Eventually though, a star will run out of hydrogen. And that's when the star starts to die. Now, that's the terminology that's used. 
um, there's a complicated sort of cycle that goes on there, and it's, it's called the alpha cycle. But basically, because there's no more hydrogen, helium starts to bang into other heliums. And those create what's called beryllium. Then a beryllium bangs into a helium, and that makes carbon. And a carbon bangs into a helium, and that makes oxygen. And so on and so on and so on. And sort of the end point of all this banging into helium, banging into these, these you know, things that are getting... And every time this happens, um, you know, the, the two heliums smoosh together and create a beryllium. Beryllium is a little bit bigger than a helium. Helium then bangs into a beryllium, turns into carbon, which is a little bit bigger. Bigger and bigger and bigger. Each time this helium bangs in, right, it's getting bigger. The end point of this is iron. Future editing Connie here. Just a little interjection, just to, to give a little bit more context to, to what I'm talking about there. So when when the star is dying, the helium or the hydrogen is used up, the helium will start to fuse, and two heliums will become a beryllium. And then a beryllium and a helium will become a carbon. A carbon and a helium will become an oxygen. An oxygen and a helium will become a neon. Are you seeing a pattern here? can see how we're skipping. So we're going from carbon to oxygen to neon. Neon and helium will become magnesium, right? I skipped over sodium there. Magnesium and helium will become silicon, and then silicon and helium, sulfur, sulfur and helium, argon, uh, argon and helium, calcium, calcium and helium, titanium, titanium and helium, chromium, chromium and helium, iron. Now, this can actually go one step further. Uh, iron and helium can come together and form nickel, but the nickel that's formed actually then decays back to a, a different form of iron anyway. Um, <laughs> so there's, it, it's a, it's, it's, well, I shouldn't say a little, it's a lot more complicated, but just in case you were wondering how all these heliums banging into other things could eventually form iron, that's, that's sort of the, the this, that's the alpha cycle. And at that point, again, there's complicated stuff that goes on, but the star will go supernova. And what happens when a star goes supernova, probably heard that term before, it explodes. And so it's sending out into the universe a lot of iron. And this iron can, you know, coagulate into meteorites. Uh, it can, through gravity, get pulled into the centers of planets like Earth. <laughs> and so that's why. That's why there's so much iron on Earth and probably lots of other planets too. Dying stars, basically. So the pigments that these ancient peoples had to use were iron-based, most of them. That's, that's the most common pigments out there, which again is why we see the common colors. This, this uh, red ochre, uh, yellow ochre, which is also, there's also iron in there. This is an iron, this is carbon, black, and chalk, which has some carbon in it as well. But, you know, these are the colors they had. There were other colors out there. Like I say, you could boil up plants and roots and things and get lovely greens and blues, but not pigments. Now, there are other colors of pigments out there, but they're not as common. So what have we got here? Well, we've got red ochre. Red ochre is also called hematite. They're not exactly the same. Red ochre is hematite that is mixed in with clay. Yellow ochre is something called um, goethite, uh, named after the, the, and those German people, I'm probably saying that wrong, um, it's named after the German philosopher uh, Goethe? Goethe. I think it's pronounced Goethe. And goethite is a yellow form of ochre that's also been, or yellow uh, mineral that's been mixed with clay, and that's, that's the yellow ochre. So we've got red ochre, hematite. Is that, look at the color on that. Is that beautiful? What does that color remind you of? Reminds me of blood, right? And if I had to guess, that's 
you know, probably one of the reasons why prehistoric people, and even people nowadays, this color is so primal, it's so visceral, right? It has such an impact. It, it looks like blood, right? What did blood represent? What does blood still represent? Death? Life? Um, why, why does this remind us of blood? Because that's, you know, maybe not that, quite that dark, but our blood is that color. Why is our blood that color? Because there's iron in our blood. Remember I said this was called hematite? Heme? Hemoglobin? Heme is, um, I think it's a Latin or Greek word. Um, and so it's the base for all those other words. Hemoglobin in our blood. Now here's something poetic. Would you like to hear a chemist wax poetic? If there's iron in our blood and the iron that's on earth, which, I mean, that's gone into our blood because of course, you know, um, you know, even though we're, we're, we're grown in our mother's wombs. I mean, the, the, the iron that's there in all living things, I mean, it, you know, all the elements that are in all living things would have had to have come from the earth originally. So if the iron that's on the earth came from dying stars, that's what's in our blood. There's stardust flowing through our veins. How's that for poetic for a chemist? Hmm? Hmm? You like that? <laughs> okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. This is not good. I'll stop. So, natural red ochre is PR102. I can write this down. So, we've got PR102. And for those of you familiar with pigments, you're probably thinking, Hold on, Connie. <laughs> it's PR 101. Yes and no. <laughs> PR 102 is the actual pigment code for natural red ochre. And natural red ochre is not often used anymore. So PR 101 is synthetic red ochre. So synthetic just means instead of, you know, mining the red ochre, like prehistoric peoples would have done, and then grinding it up and mixing it with your animal fat or whatever and painting with it, we now create um, red ochre in a lab. So how do we create the red ochre? What, ke what chemicals are in red ochre? Well, we, we already talked about some of them, right? We've got... Where have I got my... Oh, I've lost them now. Oh, no, they're there. We have... Iron. And oxygen. So, iron oxide is what's in hematite. You're probably more commonly familiar with iron oxide as rust. Rust. Not exactly, but close enough. It's the same color, right? This yellow ochre, which the, the pigment code for natural yellow ochre is PY43. Synthetic yellow ochre is PY42. So again, that's what you're going to see more commonly. That's also iron and oxygen with some hydrogen in there as well. You can actually turn yellow ochre, certain kinds, into red ochre by heating it, by roasting it. And the reason for that is quite a lot of yellow ochre is basically red ochre with water attached to it. So it's iron oxide with water attached, we call that hydrated. Makes sense, right? If you're, if you're well hydrated, what have you been drinking a lot of? Water, right? So hydrated iron oxide has little iron oxide molecules with water attached. If you heat something that's got water attached, what happens? You evaporate the water off. You evaporate the water off of, of yellow ochre and you can get red ochre. So these two things are quite related, quite related. Um, what else chemically? Um, oh, so we were talking about 
synthetic and um, natural versions of these two. So you'll notice I've got two examples here of, of hematite. I will maybe hold them close to the camera. Are they the same color? Close, but not quite, right? I've got, oops, now it's all over my hands. <laughs> I've got two examples here of yellow ochre. This is actually something called limonite. It's the mineral limonite. One of the, um, one of the minerals that, that can be used to produce yellow ochre. The other one is gutite, named after the, uh, the German philosopher Goethe. But you'll notice these aren't quite the same color either, are they? When you have natural pigments, you're not going to have a great deal of consistency, right? Because, you know, I talk about these being this iron oxide, but there's impurities in there too, right? It's, I mean, that's, that's nature, right? Nothing is really ever pure. And so you've got impurities, which is going to make, maybe in this lighter one, there's actually a little bit of this mineral mixed in. They do tend to occur, you know, naturally near each other in conjunction with each other. So maybe this lighter version of the hematite has a little bit of the yellow ochre mixed in. Who knows? So these natural pigments, PR102 and PY43, are not going to be real consistent, which is why, you know, red ochre in terms of the natural pigment, you're going to see a whole variety. You're going to see a really brown version of red ochre in some places, a more red version, um, a, a slightly orangier version, but they're all considered this natural PR102 red ochre. Same thing with PY43, natural yellow ochre. Some of it's browner, some of it's more yellow, some of it maybe even leans a little bit red. The synthetic versions of these, which is what you're going to see in modern day paints, right? They're not grinding up, well, not that I know of, <laughs> maybe some really specialized paints, I don't know, but they're not, you know, going out mining red ochre anymore and grinding it up and turning it into a pigment. What they're doing is they're, they're creating this iron oxide in a lab. And synthetic iron oxide, so what's in here, this is a little tube of Paul Rubin's watercolor. Um, it's actually called burnt sienna. The siennas are related to the ochres, same general color family. Um, in fact, sienna, I believe, is a certain kind of ochre that comes from a place in Italy. This particular uh, burnt sienna contains PR101. So you probably can't see that. It's really tiny on the side here. It contains PR101. So PR101. And it also contains P. BK11. So there's a little bit of black in here as well. And that is this. Now, I don't know if you can get a sense of the color in there or not. I'm going to paint a little bit of stuff out here in a minute so you can hopefully see there too. But this is, this PR101 is the synthetic version of PR102. The same thing up here. This yellow ochre paint, this Paul Rubens paint, this is PY42. So PY42 is the synthetic, and then there it is in the pan. And I love these colors. They're earthy. Well, of course they're earthy. They're, they're, they're made of, of rocks. That, well, not rocks. They're made of minerals, right? They're coming from the earth. When we talk about earth tones, earth, I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about, right? So PY42 is the synthetic version of PY43. What about the blacks and whites? You don't always see whites in cave paintings. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, the most common white that's probably going to be used as a pigment in prehistoric times is going to be chalk, right? Again, sometimes chalk is really white, sometimes it's a little bit yellowy, sometimes it's a little bit gray. So natural chalk is going to have some variations. Um, the color code for chalk hopefully you can see all this, is PW18. And I believe that's also the code for pretty much all the whites. Okay, not, not the synthetic, <laughs> but the whites that I have here. This is calcite. 
that's a mineral that's another um this is really pretty i don't know if you can see the the shine and the uh they call it the cleavage on there when it breaks it it breaks naturally along really sharp lines so it's very pretty that's calcite this is limestone that was another thing that they could grind up and make a white pigment out of this is just chalk I mean, if i had a ch chalkboard in front of me i could write on it with this this is kale and clay that's another thing that they could use for a white pigment i believe all of those have this same um pigment code pw18 you don't see this in modern day paints anymore because chalk just isn't a very i mean they have we have much better white pigments now so the closest we're going to get probably in our modern day paints what have i got in here this is pw4 which i believe is titanium oxide if i'm wrong i'll put it on the screen but i think pw4 is titanium oxide future editing connie here i was wrong oops pw4 is zinc white or chinese white uh titanium white or titanium oxide is actually pw6 so i was wrong pw4 is zinc white so there's some pw4 just i mean that's that's as close as i'm gonna get in terms of, of modern paints and white you also have things like titanium oxide white titanium white uh they used to have like lead white we don't have that anymore which is probably good we'll talk about lead white another time for black what's the oldest version of of a black pigment you burn a stick and then blow it out and i don't know if you ever did this as a kid i certainly did um, I would write on rocks, right? You'd hold a stick in the fire, wait, burns a while, and then blow it out, and it's covered with charcoal. And, I mean, that's, that's what I've got here. I've got a little, little beaker with some bits of charcoal in it. Uh, the pigment code for charcoal is... It, can, it could... Charcoal could be... Um, PVK6 or PVK6 is often what's called lamp black and it's still from burning but it's not so much burning of like a stick or a, or a piece of um, vegetation and then getting that charcoal lamp black I don't know if you've ever had something burning and then held like a plate over top of it like a like a ceramic plate and then taken it away and looked at the underside of the plate it, there's black on it there's soot right basically this is soot so it's sort of charcoal charcoal no well, i should probably move this down here charcoal is more down here i guess and it's pbk eight and that's where you take they used to call it vine black basically because you would take vines or, or wood or whatever burn them get the charcoal and that's how you get the black so i mean black is is probably one of the easiest pigments for any culture to to get a hold of and so they would take this this you know charcoal grind it up mix it with the animal fat or the sap or whatever and then you've got your black pigment so that's you know these you would have to actually live in an area where reds or yellow ochres were or you'd have to trade for them anybody could get a hold of black as long as you had something to burn right you can still find pbk6 and pbk8 in your pigments um this is again this paul rubens um watercolor set and it was tubes so this is called ivory black this contains pbk6 and it also contains something called pbk9 and i think i was mentioning that earlier i think pbk9 is it's called ivory black that's that's the name of that pigment um and it comes from burning ivory and then so you're still burning something it's just you're not burning uh, plant material you're actually burning um, bone or ivory and you get a, a different different shade of black it sounds funny you know you think black is black but you guys are colorists and artists you know black is not black right and so this ivory black um is going to be a little bit different i couldn't i didn't have a paint that was just pure pbk6 or pbk8 which is what prehistoric peoples would have had ivory black doesn't come into sort of our pigment history until a little bit later so again we're cheating a little bit like we were up here with the white but what are you going to do 
This little rock here is interesting. This is something called pyrolusite. And this contains manganese. Do you remember manganese from... Where's my little manganese card? Manganese from the periodic table? This is manganese and oxygen. And it, it combines to form this um, pyrolusite. They've done some chemical testing on some of the pigments used in some of the cave art. And they assumed that the black was pretty much this, right? It was, it was some kind of either lamp black or vine black, right? But occasionally they did find some manganese black. And the code for manganese black... is... PBK-14. Now, and I think I've said before, and I'll, I'll say again, obviously the prehistoric peoples did not call this PBK-14. They didn't even call it manganite. They just knew that this was a different kind of black than this. But they actually have found PBK-14, or manganese black, in some of those cave paintings. So that's neat. You know, it wasn't just this. They, there was some of this too. So here's the start of our pigment journey. Was it terribly exciting? No. But you learned a little bit about dying stars. You learned a little bit about how red and yellow ochre are related. Here's a challenge that I want to give to you guys. There was an artist called Anders Zorn. I'm just going to pull this stuff out of the way here. And I'm going to move this and hopefully not dump it. Ah, I knew I'd dump it. Well, that's okay. Got a little bit of carbon in the middle there now. Oh, I should have said um, the charcoal and stuff. Yeah, that was just pure, pure carb. So we're going to move this off to the side. Give me a sec here. So there was a Swedish chemist named Anders, or not a chemist, sorry, an artist, Swedish artist named Anders Zorn. And he was very famous for his portraits that he painted. And he quite often would use a very limited palette of colors. And this was approximately the palette he used. Look familiar? Red black, white, and yellow ochre. Now, instead of red ochre, he would use, he actually used vermilion, which is, it's related to red ochre, but it's, it's, it's a bit brighter. Um, and he used this Anders Zorn, he was around 1900s-ish, early 1900s, so he used something called flake white, which was also lead white. You probably shouldn't use lead white. <laughs> lead is very toxic. We shouldn't use lead pigments. Um, so modern day artists who want to use, they call this the Zorn palette. It, it's, it's, it's basically, it's the prehistoric palette with slight modifications, right? Modern day artists who want to use this Zorn palette will often, um, put cadmium red genuine in to the palette instead of the vermilion and titanium white instead of lead white. But the black quite often is still, um, I think Zorn used PBK nine. So he used the ivory black, but you know, other blacks would give you a slightly different look, still yellow ochre. I say, let's see if we can do a challenge. Let's do like a modified Zorn palette. So I am dug through all of my, my coloring supplies that I had. And I found all of these were the closest thing I could come up to or come up with in the different um, media that I looked at to red ochre. And then I did the same thing for 
yellow ochre. And the same thing for black and white. Let's see if we can color, and this is a challenge I'm putting out to you guys. We'll call it the prehistoric pigment challenge. See if you can color an entire page with just these four colors. So a red ochre type color, a yellow ochre type color, a black and a white. Would that be fun? Now, what kind of page or what kind of image is going to go best with that? Well, I would think probably maybe a desert scene, something with rocks. I took, where have I got them? My main supply that I think I'm going to be working with to do my own version of this challenge are ink tents. And I colored out some ink tents onto my Caran d'Ache palette here. And I'm going to activate them in a sec because, of course, ink tents are much nicer when they're activated. But I have mustard 1700, and all of this information will be in the description below. So I've got mustard 1700 right here. I've got red oxide 1910 down here. I've got antique white 2300 up there. And I've got ink black 2200. Now I chose this ink black for a reason because ink black um, should be the closest to the PBK six. So the soot black or the lamp black, hopefully. So I am going to see if I can color a picture with Here's the antique white. So it's hopefully a, a chalky looking white. Right. And then see if I can work in some, this was called mustard, but it was the closest that I could come up with in the Inktense palette to yellow ochre. Isn't that a beautiful color? Look at that. And then I'm going to see, I can bring in some of this. This is the red oxide, which I mean, red oxide, iron oxide. I'm pretty sure Inktense is trying to say this is red ochre. <laughs> um, maybe not exclusively, who knows, right? You don't know. They don't give us pigment information, but that looks pretty red ochre-ish to me. Sorry, hopefully we're not getting too much of a glare there from the lights. There's a little bit of a glare just because it's wet, I think. And then lastly, we have our ink black. And I really like using ink tents this way. In fact, this is how I used my ink tents. I don't know if you saw my last video or it might not be the last video, a previous video where I had done a Halloween page. It was Joanna Basford a Halloween page and I did the background with ink tents. This is how I did it. I scribbled it onto, I scribbled the actual pencil onto um, a, a rough, in this case, the Caran d'Ache palette, and then activated it with a water brush on the palette and then painted it onto the page. You get really intense colors that way on your page. Future editing Connie here again. I just wanted to clarify, this is a modified Zorn palette. A Zorn palette wouldn't have used um, red oxide. It would have been a brighter red, but I just wanted to go back to that idea of prehistoric pigments. If you don't have ink tents, you are more than welcome to use whatever you have. I will list probably, yeah, why not? I will list all of the, uh, the choices that I, that I had pulled for, you know, the, the red oxide, the yellow oxide and the black and white down in the description box below. So lots of choices for, sorry, I was getting tired at this point in the video and I keep saying red oxide and yellow oxide. I should be saying red ochre and yellow ochre instead. Sorry about that. You know, there's Caran d'Ache pencils, um, Black Widow pencils, I've got Holbein, I've got um, Derwent Drawing, I think I have some Prismacolor in here, Polychromos, I've got the Caran d'Ache Neocolor 2s, Copics even, 
which I realize is kind of cheating because that's not pigment, that's dye, that's ink, but still. Um, so I will list these other sort of choices. So if you want to do this challenge, but you don't have ink tents, you know, you don't need ink tents. And if you have another set of pencils or another, um, another medium, like you've got paint where you've got actual single pigment paints that have those, those pigment numbers and you want to, you know, go by that. Absolutely. So it's an open-ended challenge, but I just wanted to see, you know, what can we do on a picture with this limited color palette? Now, it's limited, but the prehistoric people didn't do a lot of color mixing that, that we can see. But if you want to take it a little further along that sort of Zorn palette route, if you use, now this is going to be um, using vermilion and not red ochre, but I don't know if you can see, maybe I can zoom in a bit. These are the colors you can get using just red, yellow, black, and white. Sorry, a little bit of a shine there because of the printer ink, but I mean, look at the combinations. Look at, look at the, the variety of color you can get there. So with a Zorn palette, it looks like you're limited, but you're not. Um, yeah, just some, some ideas for, for mixing here, right? We've got, now again, the person that was doing this was using that cadmium red, um, but you just have to be a little bit more careful with if you pick a red ochre color because it's going to give you, it's going to be a little, not muddy, but it, it's not that brilliant red, right? But you know what? Try, try on a separate piece of paper, do some color mixing before you, you know, go to your actual image you're going to color. See what different colors you can come up with. If you want to go pure, <laughs> like the prehistoric peoples would have, you're not going to do a lot of this color mixing. But just to show you, you know, you, there's some variations here. I think it's just going to be a really fun challenge. Now, what you're going to notice here is, what, what are we missing? And what were the prehistoric peoples missing in terms of their color palette? There's no blue. And because there's no blue, there's no way to make green, right? If I had a blue, I could mix it with the yellow ochre and get a green, but I don't. If I had a blue, I could mix it with the red oxide or the, the red ochre and make a purple or a violet, but I, I don't have blue. Blue pigments are rare. Prehistoric peoples didn't have blue pigments. So that's why in their cave art, you don't see green, you don't see blue, you don't see violet. Sometimes you can get a, a red ochre color depending on, the, on how finely they ground the red ochre. If you grind it so that the pigment particles are a little bit bigger, it can look almost purple. But this is it, this is what I got. So I decided I am going to do a page with it's rocks, right? This is in Kirby Roseanne's Alien Worlds. And I wanted a page where there was lots of rocks. You know, no foliage, because I can't get a green. Um, I might be able to get something that hints at blue if I water down the black enough. But I can get gray, white and black. Um, I can get orange if I mix the red ochre and the yellow ochre together. I can get a darker red ochre. Or a darker yellow ochre if I mix some blacks in there. I can get lighter reds and yellow ochres if I mix some white in there. But yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and use the palette. So this Ink Tense palette. And that's, I think, all I'm going to use. I think. I might maybe put some embellishments on afterwards. Maybe a little bit of white gel pen. I might bring in, I don't know. I'll try and be as pure as I can. But yeah, so I want to call this hashtag um, prehistoric pigments and I want to extend the challenge to you guys if you want to I'm going to try and, and post my progress on Instagram how I'm doing with this Kirby page if you guys want to do a prehistoric pigments challenge and then post your completed pages or your in progress pages on Instagram and use the hashtag prehistoric pigments let's see let's see what people can do it, sometimes using this really um, simple color palette, it can be challenging, but it can be really freeing too, because, you know, sometimes your picture turns out better because when you don't have so many colors going on, 
it's less likely things will get muddied or things will start to clash. These colors don't clash. They don't, right? They just don't. And I worry about that sometimes when I color. I think, you know, I'm bringing this, this color in and does it work well with this color? And mm, I don't know, maybe. These colors go together. This represents desert, rock, earth, sunsets, um, sunrises, right? Um, fire. So this, this is an earthy palette. And I think they're going to work really well together. So that was the first installment of our, on our pigment journey. I know the chemistry wasn't that exciting. It'll, it'll get more complicated as we go. Um, but we did talk about dying stars and we talked about stardust running in our veins and we've got a challenge. So that's it for today. Like I say, I'll try and uh, post my progress on Instagram. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope everyone is well. I hope everyone is safe and I hope everyone is enjoying their coloring. Until next time. Bye.